I'm sure you may have heard about how cortisol can make you stressed and make you gain weight, but what even is cortisol? I'll see you inside. Cortisol is a hormone that is secreted by the zona fasciculata in the adrenal gland. And this is just a subsection of cells located in the adrenal gland. And the signal for cortisol is typically either a low blood sugar or a perceived stress. And the reason why both of these signals for cortisol is because both of these states stimulate the need for glucose production and alertness. And now the way that cortisol is actually stimulated and secreted is through what's referred to as the hypothalamic pituitary axis. In the hypothalamus, specifically in this subsection of cells called the paraventricular nucleus, the first kind of signal for cortisol is actually the release of corticotropin releasing hormone or CRH, and this will travel through the vasculature to the pituitary gland. And CRH stimulates the corticotropic cells in the pituitary gland to secrete adrenocorticotropic hormone, or also known as ACTH. And now ACTH binds to a ACTH receptor within the cells of the zona fasciculata of the adrenal gland that I mentioned earlier. And this is where cortisol production actually occurs. And I understand this sounds like a lot of vocabulary, but this is simply the steps that are necessary to send a signal from the hypothalamus to the adrenal gland to produce cortisol. So ACTH will bind to a G protein coupled receptor, which means that it doesn't actually enter the cell, but it actually just binds to a receptor, which causes this cascade that occurs inside the cell. And now inside the cell, we have ATP, and there's a specific enzyme called adenyl cyclase that isn't actually metabolizing the ATP at the moment. However, when this ACTH actually binds to this receptor, ATP gets turned into cyclic AMP. And now there's another step here, because cyclic AMP will activate what's called PKA. And PKA is responsible for kind of turning on these dormant enzymes inside their cell that catalyze the reaction of creating cortisol. So now that we have this PKA actually phosphorylated or turned on, it will do a few things that turns cholesterol into cortisol. So cholesterol is actually the precursor to cortisol. And cholesterol will first be turned into pregnenolone. And then pregnenolone is turned into progesterone. Progesterone is then turned into 11-deoxycorticosterone. And then this 11-deoxycorticosterone is turned into corticosterone or cortisol. So just to recap, the signal starts out in the brain, is sent to the pituitary gland, and then the pituitary gland to the adrenal gland, where cholesterol is biotransformed into cortisol. And now what are the actual functions of cortisol? So about 25% of cortisol is transported in the blood by albumin, and the other 75% is transported by corticosterone binding globulin, or CBG. And cortisol acts on many different organs in very different ways. Cortisol will actually enter a cell without a transporter, and it binds to the intracellular receptor called the GCR or glutocorticoid receptor. And now this part's really cool. This glutocorticoid receptor will actually go into the nucleus of the cell and cause the transcription of specific DNA sequences. Simply, this means that it will go into the DNA and there are specific portions of the DNA that code for the production of specific proteins. And what this receptor does is it will actually bind to this sequence of DNA causing the transcription of these proteins. And these DNA sequences actually code for the production of proteins that will catabolize proteins within the cell into individual amino acid. So what this receptor does is it actually codes for the proteins that will basically eat the cell from the inside. And it makes a lot of sense that we need to specifically turn on the cortisol receptor to actually produce these proteins because if they were always functioning when we were at rest, we would simply be eating away all the intracellular proteins that we have. 
but in states where we have cortisol production, this is something that we need because we are trying to actually liberate amino acids into the bloodstream. And then these amino acids enter the bloodstream and travel to the liver where they undergo gluconeogenesis, producing glucose. And I'm sorry, but I completely forgot to mention, all of this is going to occur in the muscle cells, bone cells, and connective tissue because this is where the majority of our stored protein is. And then if we move on to the adipose cells, cortisol goes through the same process inside of an adipose tissue as it does in a muscle, bone, and connective tissue. However, the genes that are encoded for produce proteins that catabolize triglycerides within the fat cell. This is simply because muscle and bone is a storage depot for amino acids, and fat tissue is a storage depot for triglycerides, specifically fatty acids and the glycerol backbone. So a triglyceride is one glycerol molecule and three fatty acids. And the first step of oxidizing this triglyceride is actually removing each one of the fatty acids, and these fatty acids can be used directly to make ATP. And then the glycerol backbone goes through gluconeogenesis like the amino acids and is turned into glucose, which is also used for ATP. With that being said, one of the next episodes will actually be the entire process of basically burning body fat explained in detail. But that will be next episode. Right now we have to move on to the liver cells. So the genes encoded for in the liver cells will actually produce the enzymes that are required for this gluconeogenesis process that I was speaking about. So not only do we have more of the molecules inside of our bloodstream to turn into glucose, but we will now have more of the enzymes required to turn amino acids, lactate, and glycerol into glucose. And once this process occurs, it will then increase our blood glucose levels. And remember that the reason that cortisol was produced in the first place was either because our blood glucose levels began to drop or because we perceived stress and wanted to increase our blood glucose so we have more fuel available to take action. So now we can actually move on to the nervous system. And the nervous system is comprised of different cell subtypes and different cells have different effects on the nervous system. And now cortisol evokes the transcription of genes that increase the receptor for a neurotransmitter called norepinephrine, or you may also know it as noradrenaline. And this makes us much more sensitive to norepinephrine. And norepinephrine can actually increase vasoconstriction or the tightening of our muscle cells. It will also increase our blood pressure, therefore we are moving more nutrients through our body. And in the liver, norepinephrine can cause glycogen catabolism. And this is just the process of taking the stored glucose, which is now in the form of glycogen in the liver, and turning it into free glucose molecules that can be pushed into the bloodstream and used for energy. This process is referred to as glycogenolysis, and I would love to do a separate episode describing that in detail. But once again, we need to move on, and now we are talking about the immune cells. So cortisol actually transcribes genes that inhibit immune cells from producing inflammatory mediators, such as histamine and cytokines. And now this is interesting. A lot of times when we have extremely high stress, leading to extremely high cortisol, we will have a lower functioning immune system. It's hypothesized that the reason for this is that if there is an environmental stress, the body should not be worried about trying to fight viruses or internal pathogens. Rather, we should be focused on whatever stress is in the environment. However, if we have chronic stress leading to chronically high cortisol levels, we will simply be shutting down our immune system for a very long period of time, and we may become actually much more at risk of something like a virus or an infection. And that's because those inflammatory mediators that cortisol stops are actually the signal that are required to locate the presence of a virus or infection in the body and remediate it. So without the signal, we simply just do not respond to the internal pathogen. And the example that's often given for this is that if you are in a state of high stress for a very long period of time, oftentimes you realize that you don't get a cold or a sickness at all. 
but immediately after removing or at least reducing the stress, you suddenly almost automatically become sick. And this is because your body can now locate the pathogen because cortisol is no longer inhibiting these inflammatory mediators. And all of the signs and symptoms of getting a cold is actually because of the inflammatory process that occurs to actually kill and fight off the pathogen. But once again, when cortisol is increased, this is not our main goal. The main goal is simply to inhibit the stress or increase our blood glucose. And now finally, we can move on to the hypothalamic cells, and these are cells inside of the brain. And cortisol will actually encode genes in the hypothalamus that inhibit the production of CRH. And if you remember, looping all the way back around to the initial signal for cortisol, it was actually this CRH produced in the hypothalamus. And in biology, physiology, and neuroscience, this is referred to as a negative feedback loop. And this is an elegant system that the body has. Simply, corticotropin-releasing hormone, or CRH, is trying to make the body produce more cortisol. So let's say at some point this corticotropin-releasing hormone doesn't make it down to the pituitary gland. Therefore, we don't actually produce the cortisol. We won't have the production of cortisol turning off the corticotropin-releasing hormone, so we will continue to signal for the production of cortisol. And now this makes sense, because let's say the hypothalamus produced the CRH and then just turned off right after that. What if something gets messed up down the line and we don't actually produce any cortisol? So it seems that we've kind of adapted this mechanism to ensure that cortisol is produced by only stopping the signal to produce it by the cortisol molecule itself. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode and I hope you learned a little bit more about cortisol. I think the big thing is not to be scared of cortisol because any hormone that the body naturally produces has some sort of benefit and it's a necessity to keep our blood sugar stable, and respond to stress. However, as we discussed a little bit, having too much cortisol and maybe not a good reason for having cortisol can actually be a bad thing because it can begin to break down all of your tissues and it will also shut down your immune system to an extent. Therefore, it definitely is true that having high stress for long periods of time definitely is a bad thing, but we do want a little bit of stress to make sure that we are in action and we are able to function properly. And before I keep rambling on this topic, I just want to end this one here. I want to say thank you for listening and I hope you listen to the next episode. Have a great day and once again, thank you for listening.